So, I haven't cleared this with uh, John and, and Tim, but I'd like to take a few minutes of my time to, uh, to do a little product demo. But I, I think it's okay because technically it's, it's not my product, and also it's, it's 500 years old. Um, so if we could bring up on, on the screen here, uh, it's, I'm Scott Berlin, Berlin Johnson, by the way. Um, this is a, uh, is a version of uh, St. Augustine's uh, On the Art of Preaching that was published in 1467 by the German printers Johann Fust and Peter Schiffer. Uh, Schiffer and Fust were, were old colleagues, actually, and disciples of Gutenberg. Um, they're kind of most famous, actually, for being the first uh, successful uh, commercial printers, because as most of you probably know, Gutenberg was kind of a disaster as a businessman. Uh, but one of the reasons why they were so successful as printers is that they actually were kind of relentless innovators, both with the technology of the book and also with the form of, of the book itself. And this slide is actually a great example of this. This is the first printed index of a book that was alphabetically arranged. This is the beginning of kind of the alphabetical index. Now, I'm not alone in finding this period of kind of the post-Gutenberg era interesting for, for the obvious kind of rich connections that it has to our own period today. The Augustinian index was part of an arms race of new features that were being developed between competing printers at the time. They weren't just competing by releasing new titles and new translations. The functionality of the book was evolving too. Some of the first advertisements for books, in fact, some of the very first advertisements in the history of kind of the form of advertising, were, were created by these printers promoting the kind of better arrangement of the indices of the books. And in fact, Schiffer and Fust actually wrote that the Augustinian version was well worth the price alone just for the index because they make it so much easier to use. That was their exact language. So in other words, our books aren't just informative, they're also user-friendly, right? It's a language we're, we're still using today. Now, what's different today, of course, is the rate of change. It took almost a half century for the alphabetical index to become a common standard. Arabic page numbers weren't adopted until the middle of the 1500s. There were feature wars in this new technology platform, but each new salvo was fired only once every 20 years. No wonder it was so hard for them to anticipate how disruptive the printed book would turn out to be. The product was only upgraded once every 20 years, and they'd never lived through the experience of having the world upended by new hardware platforms. Now, what's, they may have been a long time in coming, but when all those features coalesced into the system of citation, indices and page numbers and footnotes and cross-references, they helped usher in the scientific revolutions of the Enlightenment. Entire new ways of interacting with information became possible because we had agreed on a standardized way to describe where the information lived and how to point people towards it. Now, this story is both familiar and strange to us. It is strange because the rate of change is so different. It was just 20 years ago, almost to the day, the anniversary of it was actually just last week, that Tim Berners-Lee first proposed the World Wide Web specification. Think of how much has changed over those 20 years, blogs and Google and Wikipedia and YouTube and social networks. In the time it took the first printers to introduce one feature, we have introduced 100. But it is also familiar because the fundamental breakthrough that you see on the screen in this image from St. Augustine is precisely the same innovation that made this extraordinary run of the last 20 years possible. We agreed 20 years ago on a standard for describing where information lives and how to point to it. If, the, if you ask the question that I ask in this new book, where do good ideas come from? What are the environments that lead to innovation? With the web, the answer begins with this original breakthrough. We agreed on the URL and on the link. Without that agreement, none of this is possible. We would all be sitting at a CompuServe developers conference at an airport Marriott somewhere. Now, it's tempting to look at the pace of change and assume that we're even more clueless about the future, or at least, as, as my friend Clay Shirky has argued, that we're in a comparable blind spot, that the changes ahead are so unthinkable that we can't really anticipate all the ways that the internet will transform our society. 
But I think our condition is fundamentally different from the Gutenberg era, precisely because the feature wars now happen on the scale of months and not on generations. And we have a long and well-studied history of disruptive technologies to, to refer back to. So in a way, the rate of change is an opportunity for us to predict the future more accurately because we can see patterns forming in all those changes, patterns that were much harder to see in 1467. We have foresight. When you have one new feature a generation, it's a miracle when it arrives. It's a singular event. When you have 100, you can see trends. And one of those trends is this. For the first time in 20 years, the link and the URL are losing market share. This is part of what Chris Anderson was arguing in the, in the Web is Dead essay. For the first time since I graduated from college, which I assure you was a long time ago, the world of digital information that cannot be easily linked to is growing at a meaningful clip. Now, there's a great deal of information in apps that we don't need links to. For the most part, we don't use URLs to point to our video games or corporate calendars or email messages. So the fact that, that many apps are evolving in unlinkable forms is not likely to be catastrophic. We won't be worse off as a culture if we don't figure out a way to link to a specific screen of Angry Birds, for instance, right? <laughs> the danger, in fact, lies elsewhere in a region of the digital information landscape that actually wasn't really mentioned almost at all in the Web is Dead essay, which is books. I'll give you one personal data point. My book, Invention of Air, that came out about 18 months ago, we sold about 2% of the copies as e-books. This new book, Where Good Ideas Came From, that came out just a month ago, we're going to sell about 25% in e-books, right? So you've got a 10x increase <clears throat> in the space of less than two years. And that's on a platform where people are actually paying for the information. And I think this is great news on a lot of fronts. It's a great time to be a book author. It's maybe the most interesting time since that that period after Gutenberg, if you're interested in exploring the new possibilities of the form and the medium. But for all the excitement about digital books, there is a critical problem. There's no standardized way to link to a page of a digital book. It's the most carefully crafted and edited text that we have, truly the richest source of information in the world, and it is unlinkable. Now, I think there's a solution to this problem, and it happens to be a solution that helps with the problem of valuable information getting trapped unlinkable in, in apps as well. It's not a technological fix because the technology already exists. It's more of a principle or a best practice. And I've been calling it web redundancy. A web redundant magazine app on the iPad, for instance, has clear links to a mirror site on the web so that for each article, if we want to cite, tweet, blog, retweet, reblog, or email a reference to the article, we know where to find it. The version can be behind a paywall or some other kind of barrier if the publisher chooses. What matters is that there's a URL you can point to. Now, this is already happening in an informal way, but I think it's up to us to encourage that convention. When we see apps that aren't web redundant, it should be a flaw that we're quick to point out, like excessive file size or a confusing user interface. But the more radical premise behind web redundancy is that it should apply to digital books as well. Every page of every book should have a shadow version of itself that lives on the web so that we can build indices and connect ideas in ways that would have amazed Schiffer and Fust 500 years ago. Obviously, Google is working on a version of this with Google Books, but mostly the publishers have been fighting or suing Google when, in fact, they should be doing it for themselves. They can wrap those pages in whatever forms of copyright protection they want, but unless they embrace web redundancy as a strategy, all those extraordinary words will continue to live in the remote continents of the unlinkable. So that is where we are. We can't predict the future in its entirety, but we can anticipate where it might take us and adjust our strategies accordingly. We can let the old and deep art of linking to things that dates back to that page of that book of St. Augustine grow less and less relevant in an unconnected world of apps and ebooks, Or we could choose a different path for the art of the link. We could choose to get better at it. Thank you very much.